The Technique Series is brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching. Did you know that you can get a 100% free form check from one of our expert strength coaches? Seriously, absolutely 100% free. No credit card needed, no questions asked. Just go to barbelllogic.com slash technique and sign up for the free Barbell Logic experience now. Do that right now and then enjoy the show. Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. This is the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and this is Matt Reynolds, as always. And today we're going to talk about the deadlift. I don't know we say the squat's the king of the lifts, but man, the deadlift is, is darn good. It ain't the queen of the lifts, but it's a close second. I actually think it's probably the truest test of strength. Yeah, I think so. The deadlift is the truest test of strength. It's, it's um, Everybody can do it. I can do Elderly, it. Elderly, it's ugh, so good. Yeah, the deadlift, it's, um, like you said, it's probably the best true test of strength. Yeah. And everybody can, almost every single person can do it. Uh, the deadlift, it's probably got less to do with anthropometry than anything else, if you do a conventional deadlift, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly there are longer-legged lifters that have a, sort of a higher fulcrum there up at the hip, have a little better leverages for the deadlift. Uh, Longer-legged people tend to also have long arms, so if it's a lockout, a little you know, closer to the knees, but in general, deadlifts are, are, you know, it's, it's a pretty even playing field with deadlifts. Yeah. That's certainly not the case with squat, long femured people versus short femured people. It's just so much less moment for those shorter femured people. So uh deadlift man, John Paul Sigmarson said, uh, there's no reason to live if you can't deadlift. Right. And uh, <laughs> telling enough, the guy died deadlifting right. <laughs> and massive cardiac event deadlifting a few years later and, uh, and but you, died. But, but you're not going to do that. Uh, I think the first thing to do, we can talk about all the advantages and the musculature that works and we can probably do that as we go. But let's talk about, for those of you guys who are listening, how to actually pull the deadlift first. Let's go through this five-step program. So the first thing we do is what step? Let's do step one. Step one. You take a fairly narrow stance with your shins one inch from the bar. Exactly right. So you walk forward to your shins or one inch from the bar. Your shins are totally neut neutral. You don't lock your knees and make your shins go backwards. But when with neutral shins, you walk forward till your, till your shins are one inch from the bar. And that puts the bar where? It's a right over your midfoot. Okay, so from step one, once you've established that you're one inch from the bar and the bar is directly over your midfoot, you don't get to take a, a step, not even a little tiny step. You don't get to move your feet at all. Or the bar. And you don't get to roll the bar at all. Yep. At all, no matter what. If you do, we got to start this thing over. And so we're really strict about that as we're teaching people the, the deadlift setup. So step one, walk forward till your shins are one inch from the bar. Step two. Step two, without moving the bar, you hump over and grab the bar with your hands right outside your legs. That's right. So you just grip the bar just outside your legs. We're, we're going to start with a double overhand grip. Yep. Everybody should take a double overhand grip because the deadlift is, while it is a full body lift, it's a, certainly a back strength lift hamstrings, ass, all that fun stuff. Is ass the, is that the correct muscle group for mm -hmm. physiological sample? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, what, that's the way it's taught in A&P. Uh, the glutes, it is also a grip exercise. And so we want to work yeah. the grip as much as we can until the grip becomes a limiting factor, at which point we'll talk about changing the grip. What's your double overhand PR? Um, I think I've done 495. That's That makes me angry. And I, my hands aren't very big. <clears throat> I'll tell you what's funny. All the strength in my hands are in my thumb, index finger, and middle finger. Well, yeah, nobody's like, hey, man, I got strong pinkies. Well, I mean, like, except that even if I do like the captains of crush grippers, uh, right, right. I actually drop my pinky off. Don't even use it. Don't use it at all. It's just a, yeah. Uh, it's, well, it's I have like a little the dwarf appendix. pinky. Look at my little dwarf pinky. Yeah, it's pretty gross. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like a seven-year-old's, like my seven-year-old daughter. It's one of like vestigial organs, like like the <laughs> appendix or something. Yeah, you're like, did, yeah, just I didn't get rid of that. It. Yeah. Yeah, if I ever like actually needed it, you know. There was a movie, a Tarantino movie, where they cut a guy's pinky off. Four Rooms, I think, is the name of that right. movie. It's one of his early, early movies, like before Reservoir Dogs and stuff, I think. And, and uh, can't remember, I think he's the one that gets his pinky cut off. They get in a bet, and the guy's got a butcher knife, and he takes the guy's pinky off. But anyway, uh, yeah, you don't really need it. So I double overhand up to I, my typical, I double overhand up to 405. That's typically what I do on a workout. And then when I get to 405, I have to switch the grip. I guess we can talk about the grip now. So the grip, you really have two options with your grip. You got three. 
You have three options with a grip? I'm sure you do. After the double overhand, or are you counting the double overhand? I'm counting the double overhand. Yeah, you got double overhand, which everybody should use. In the beginning. In the beginning. And for most of you in the beginning, the vast majority of you in the beginning, you'll be able to use double overhand grip for all of your deadlift sets. Yep. Because you won't be strong enough yet to open up your hand. A double overhand grip, for those of you guys watching on the camera, if this is the bar, you're just going to grab... Just like you normally would. If right? you jump up and grab the monkey bars, you're going to grab it hand. exactly right. For most people, the thumb will actually be on top of the index finger a little bit on mm-hmm. a normal double overhand grip. So the, the <laughs> thumb is on top of the index finger. Yeah, you can, can make a that. fist around the bar. Correct. Now, we have two options when that doesn't work anymore. And the reason that doesn't work is because the bar spins. And so the bar is going to spin away from, it's going to roll away from my fingers and open up my hands, roll down into the tips of my fingers and fall out when it gets really, really yeah, heavy. It, yeah, you can feel it, man. When it starts to, uh, the first time you pick up a heavy one, it starts to unroll your hands. <laughs> yeah. It's panic inducing. Yeah, it's it's awesome. And so at that point, most people go to an alternate grip, mm-hmm. which is, uh, one hand supinated and one hand pronated. So one one underhand, one overhand. It doesn't matter which is which, right? And that works pretty well because the bar wants to roll one direction and the other hand, the bar wants to roll the other direction. So they cancel each other out and it doesn't roll. Yep. The downside of that is what? Well, it's hard to keep that, that uh, supinated hand. It's hard to keep this bar on the supinated hand side on the shins. You tend to have like a helicoptering motion and where it's some, you know, and it's, it's, Asymmetrical, so we're at some risk of some injury, some muscle avulsions. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So it's probably a little more dangerous. It's not super. It's obviously not symmetrical. But I think that for most mortals, they're not in any real danger of a bicep tear or anything. Probably not. I don't know that I've ever heard of a bicep tear for under five hundred pounds. I don't even know if I've heard of bicep tear under six hundred pounds. I'm sure there are some. Yeah, some elderly people maybe could, but uh, I don't think that's going to be a problem for most people. Um, So you know. That's probably the general purpose grip that most people will use, and the other yeah. one would be the would be the hook grip that yeah, we the hook get, grip. So get again, the, for those of you guys that have this on camera, it's what I do is on the hook grip. I would grab the bar with my thumb first. Yep. It looks just like a double overhand grip from the front. You can't really tell the difference, but what you do is you grab the bar with your thumb first, and then you grab your thumb with your middle and index finger. You got to get it with both. If you just get the index finger, it's not going to work. So you're going to grab the thumbnail with your middle finger. And what that will do is that it will create some friction in the hand and it just locks in place and doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, your thumb cams over the bar and you, you get to hold your thumb instead of the bar. So the rotation of the bar doesn't really matter. That's exactly You're right. able to hold that thumb so you don't have to overcome the torque. You know, it's strong. You know, people people pull, you know, seven, eight sure. or more with the, with the hook grip. It could be a challenge for people with small hands. You know, Patrick Yeomans pulled a big deadlift at the meet and got that thing up. Gosh, I mean, he was two inches from lockout. Yep. And he's got, he's, he's got a, Patrick's got smaller hands. He's got really small hands because I have small hands and his fingers came up to my last knuckle line. Yeah. And I, he said, what am I going to do? And I said, well, if you go to your third and you pull it again, it comes hand, out. Hand you're in trouble. transplant. <laughs> That's right. Hand augmentation. So we, oddly <laughs> enough, we switched him at the meet from hook grip to alternate grip. I and said, when's the last time you alternate gripped? And he said, I, never. <laughs> I said, well, what are you going to do? It's out of meat. I said, it'll feel weird and just pull it. Don't stop pulling. So he did. And, and uh, yeah, and he got his last deadlift, which was good. So small hands, females have a hard time with that, yeah. obviously, because they have small hands typically. Yeah. And so the ladies bar, you don't see Rogue sells this Bella bar. And there's a, you know, there's a, these 35 pound or what are they? 15 kilo bars. Mm-hmm. You see them out there. 33 pound, 15 kilo. Right. You know, and it's really more about the diameter of the bar than it is the weight on the bar. So Correct. that's really why we use a ladies bar when we do. So, because they on a clean it. and a snatch, on a clean in a snatch, you have to hook. Yep. You have to go double overhand. If you go double overhand, it's heavy. It's going to open your hand up. So when a heavy, clean, or snatch must be hook gripped. Yep. And if it must be hook gripped, then you take an enormous amount of the population out of the potential of hook gripping. If you use a full, yep. you know, 29 millimeter bar, they can't hook. By the way, I have a hard time hooking a 29 millimeter bar. Mm-hmm. It's another reason why I like deadlifting with a 28 and a half, 28. 27. Mm-hmm. So deadlift bar, those things are way easier to hook grip. Now the yep. downside to a hook grip, because the circumference of the bar is smaller is pi times diameter. That's exactly right. So, you know, pi is three and change. Yeah. So you add for every millimeter in diameter of that uh, bar that you go up, the circumference goes up over three millimeters. Mm-hmm. It's a big deal. So it's a three X deal. Correct. And, uh, you know, it so makes you a big deal, if, big you're, deal. if you're close anyway, the downside for most people with hook 
is that it hurts really bad. Yeah, it sucks. I won't do it. I've converted because I don't want to tear a bicep. Right. I've converted the last couple of years. So, um, and I know I'm never going to pull heavy enough to really worry yeah, about it. Yeah, which is so fine. I don't do it. So, <laughs> well, I'm going to remind you of this conversation when you're in the hospital. This time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right. So, yeah, so you can hook. Um, what I would suggest if you're learning the hook, when you decide, I'm, I'm going to make the decision to start hook gripping, I would actually do all of your warm ups with the hook first. So, let's say you can deadlift to that yeah. point. Let's say you can deadlift 365 for a set of five. So, wait, man, it's really not about learning it. It's about getting acclimated to how bad it's it hurts. It's acclimated how bad it hurts. And it, 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 you know, it's just like anything else. You'll build some callus there and it'll kind of deaden the nerve a little yeah, bit. You'll create nerve damage under your thumbnail. That's right. And you won't be able to feel so, it. Yeah, and then the, yep. So what I have people do is, you know, if you're going to deadlift 365 for a set of five, you're going to try to hook grip it. What we're going to do is we're going to do 135 for a set of five with the hook grip. Mm -hmm. Probably 225 for a set of five with the hook grip. Maybe we go 275 with the hook grip for a couple and then just go ahead and do your 315 alternate grip and your 365 alternate grip. And then the next time you're going to go up and do a little heavier than 275 with the hook grip. Right. And that really about four or five sessions will tend to get you to a, a point where you can hook grip just about anything. It's still not going to feel very good for a while. Right. But I tell you what, once that hook grip bites, people will, you'll understand. And it actually reduces the range of motion just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you can carry the bar a little lower in your hands than you do on an alternate. When you turn that hand... And you get that that supination. Yeah, when you rotate your forearm, it actually shortens your arm. It shortens your arm a little bit. It's, it's like, like when you twist a rope up, that thing gets short. As the more you twist yeah. it, it gets shorter. Yeah, that's so, a good. And then also with the hook grip, we actually get to open our hand just a little bit. So I think with the the hook grip is double overhand. Yep. But then you hook it, and then your hand's actually a little more open than it would be with that ball back grip that yep. you do with the double overhand. Yep. So you pick up a quarter inch there. You pick up an eighth of an inch by not supinating. Yeah, it's worth it. That's good. By the way, uh, for those of you that deadlift uh, or even do pull-ups or chin-ups or things like that, and you tend to tear calluses all the time, you're putting the bar too deep yeah. in your hand. The bar should sit right on the pad. Is that what that's called? Of the of the yeah, I'll call it like like your dog, like the, I'm a dog. The pad of your pa your your palm front paw there, right? Uh, but yeah, <laughs> about your fingers. So again, just like kind of right on top of your knuckles there. That's actually where you should set the bar. What most people do when they're trying to get a really good grip is they set it deep into their mm -hmm. deep into their palm. Seems and, right, right? Which I seems mean, the, right. And then the very first thing it does, it rolls or shifts down, and it'll grab those calluses and rip those calluses open. So if you're tearing calluses, just set it on the pad, then wrap your hand around yeah. and you'll, you'll be fine. I press those yellow calluses right onto the bar and then close my hand Correct. around it. And it's easy. That's exactly what I do, too. Put your callus directly on the bar. Don't let the bar go up in the soft part of the palm of your hand and slide down to those calluses and so what about straps bro yeah so i'm not a fan of straps until it's really heavy and or you're doing a fair amount of volume you know if you start doing multiple sets of five as we get into an in, mm -hmm. in a intermediate uh programming then certainly adding some straps is okay adding straps all the time i don't think is okay no um, i use them for rack pulls if somebody like yeah. rack pulls really heavy our, our deals in rack pulls or multiple sets of five. So for me, the rule is, is it going to be in your hands a lot? Right. So when you pull a set of five, you've got it off the ground, you lock it out, you set it back down, and then it's not in your hand. The weight's not in your hand. You can kind of reset your grip. RDLs, you unrack it, and it's in your hand for like 45 sure. seconds or something sure. like that, and it's heavy. So it's great for that. And then rack pulls often take so long to break off the darn pins. Yep that your hand will un unwind. Well, and once you get good at rack pulls, a lot of times you're pulling a lot more than what you can actually deadlift. And yeah, so you, just, you may not want to hook it. Like yeah, if you hard. pull 500, you may rack pull 555. Yep. Ugh, strap yeah, that could be difficult. So, uh, but first, so yeah, don't buy, if you're a dude, don't buy straps at all until you can pull 405. Don't even buy them. Oh, don't yeah, have them in the building. Again, remember you just asked me, like I have small hands and I can double overhand 405 on my worst day of the year and I've double overhand almost 500 pounds. So you, with those you, dainty hands. Yeah. My, my so, double overhand PR is four or five, which I'm quite proud of. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, and that's a solid double overhand, no hook, no, you know, and uh, yeah, you sh definitely shouldn't touch straps <laughs> if so, you deadlift less than four. And so when five. I pick up every time I pick up a 45 pound plate, I pinch it. Yeah, me too. Cause I'm working on that grip. I yeah, pinch that plate. I don't, I don't wrap my fingers around yeah, and you've the got the big competition yeah, so rogue I, plates. So I, you, you know, you'll grab a, a 55 pound rogue and you'll pinch, pinch it, it and yeah. hold it. By the way, there's a really good video. I think it was Klokov made a few years ago. It's, I say a few years ago, it may have been 10 years ago. So that's probably six or seven years mm -hmm. ago of him pinch flipping your pinch flip plates. Mm -hmm. So you start oh, with a, sort of like a 15 or something, right? And you take it, you pinch it and you throw it up in the air with one hand and then you catch it in a pinch grip. 
And then after you can do the 15, a bunch of times you move the 25. Mm -hmm. And if you do the 25, you know, you know, 35, it's the only thing good. The 35 is right. And, uh, and then the 45, and then eventually you get to that 25 kilo plate, the 55 pound plate. And he's got a video of him taking a 55 pound plate with one hand and flipping it up in the air and catching it with one hand, flipping it up in the air and catching it with one hand. And so or you take, uh, take two 45s, you know, put the dish in. That's re- pinch them. Two 45s is hard. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly you can do, do two 45s. I'll, we'll talk about you on the podcast. Two 25s yeah. is a pretty, you take two 25 iron plates Put it so that the lips face in, pinch, so that's 50 pounds. Pick it up and hold it, and just do a hold as long as you can. That pinch bit works pretty good. I actually think that carries over better than a, than like a sort of captain's crush yeah, I do too. gripper. I think yeah, that's, the, that's kind of a circus. The lever, the lever on the, I don't know, I guess these are the flexors of the fingers, yep. is so long when you do the pinch. The captain's yep. crunch, you can get it up close yep. to that joint and really bear down on it. Yep. Yeah, that's good. So that's the first two, first two steps. So first step is one inch. We're going to take our stance one inch from the bar. Scott, we kind of breeze through it, but with a narrow grip or a narrow stance, your yeah. stance is going to be significantly more narrow than you're going to take on a squat mm-hmm. or on a press. The fins, I'm not telling you to do this, but the Finnish guys who are good deadlifters, they often deadlift with their heels touching each other. Yeah. Um, and again, I wouldn't suggest that, but for me, I deadlift with my heels about five inches apart. No. Three inches apart. Three. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and there's some videos on Brett McKay on his Instagram. Yeah. Deadlifted man. And he's just it's like pretty close. Tricycle stance. Like it's yeah. really close. Yeah. We're trying to, there's a moment arm game we're playing there, right? We're taking some of that moment off the sagittal side plane. And when we get bow legged, like I'm using air quotes, bow legged, we push our knees out. We can take some of that moment off of the side plane, put it on the frontal plane, brings the hips a little closer to the bar. Yeah, and we start playing that competition game. And we've talked about that in the mm-hmm. previous Talks about squat and bench press and press. And so let's uh, just use our adductors. Let's just use our adductors. Let's just use our our abductors, abductors, hold the femur in external rotation and the knees are abducted out. And it lets the adductors, adductors, the inside of your thigh contribute Mm -hmm. to hip extension. And so, again, because one of our criteria is we want to use the most muscle mass possible. We always want to push our knees out. So let's go to step three. So, so step one, our stance is one inch from the bar. Yep. With a close stance. Stance pretty close together. Step two, we're going to grab just outside our legs, which for almost everybody is going to put your hands right where the neural starts. Now, if you're a great big boy, you're 330, you weigh mm-hmm. 330 pounds, mm-hmm. untrained, and you weigh 300 pounds or 350 pounds or 400 pounds, you're going to have to take a little water stance just yeah. because your belly and your midsection is going to be in the way. But essentially, we want our arms hanging straight down on a deadlift, right? We don't want any. So we want our, our yeah, arms we, are going to be totally vertical from our shoulders when we stand up. So that's kind of where we want to set it. Yeah, if we did a snatch grip deadlift, our range of motion would be way, way longer. Correct. So we, we like those we like those straight arms. Yes, yeah, snatch grip is going to, going to artificially shorten the arms. And I want my arms to be as long as possible. And so so I take that, that grip just outside my legs. And then the third step is without moving the bar, which is where most people screw this up. The bar's staying where it is, right over the middle of the foot. I'm going to bend my knees and shove my shins forward until the shins touch the bar. And I'm going to yep. stop. I'm not going to keep shoving them forward any further. I'm not going to roll the bar at all. By the way, if you're a coach or you, you just have a workout partner, if the if the weight plates have a logo on them, like if they say rogue, you, the easy thing to do is just watch the word. If the word rogue rotates, it moved. Yep. It's easier to see than the bar itself. And so you kind of watch those plates. Or if you're videoing yourself in the side, after you get done with your set, yep. look at it. Step three, shins forward till they touch the bar and then knees out. We're going to push our knees out hard until they touch really the crook of our elbows. Now yep. think about this. If your stance now, out, out means apart, apart right? uh, to bow the legged. sides, to mm-hmm. the sides, like, like your bow legged. But again, we've talked about cues. Yep. And so bow legged is a term I use as kind of an overcorrection cue. Like, oh, I get what you're saying. I, I want some angle on the shin going out to the knee and then back in. And so it's well, what is it like? Knock knee is the opposite. of Yes. Yeah, so and we're trying to get away from being valgus. Would, I don't know. I don't know what the actual kinesiology sort of term is there. And certainly, with, you know, if you're training a. Uh, a 45, 50 year old person that doesn't understand anatomy to say abduct and externally rotate your mm-hmm. femurs. That doesn't work. And so I just say, get bow legged, right. right? Get your knees out. Vegas so. knees. <laughs> no. Right. And so, um, and so if our feet are closer together to each other, I can be more bow legged mm-hmm. than if my feet take a wider stance. There's so much that's good about that. You know, sure. uh, yeah, getting getting bow legged, get your get your femurs out of your way. So if you got a little belly mm-hmm. or whatever, you can get, get down in the hole more comfortably. 
It lets us set up with a little bit lower hip. We always want to be, you know, we don't want to drop our hips more than we need to, but if we can have a more upright torso, we sure do like that. And I think it's less about even getting a lower hip and more about getting the hips closer to the barbell. Well, that's, it, so there's that's less it. moments. So if you think about like where the barbell sits yep. horizontally, the hips move closer when yep. we get, when we get, quote unquote, bow legged. And it's, so uh, it's just easier to get down there like that. So yeah. We'll and then people. again, it uses more muscle mass. So it, it allows the abductors, muscle. the outside of your butt, your glute medius, glute minimus, and your external rotators. And there's six of those, all the weird ones, obturator, obturators and piriformis and all that's that stuff. That like high, that's like that high gravity beer, right? <laughs> it's like high gravity obturator. beer. Yeah, that's right. Spaten, obturator. Yeah. <laughs> obturator, 8.4%. Uh, so. so you can go see some, uh, go look up some videos of uh, KK, you know, Constantine, yeah, Constantinov. Constantine, yeah. And uh, he or Matt Reynolds or, or Matt Reynolds or, or Brett McKay. actually actually Brett. You. It's easier to see in Brett's videos than almost anybody. He, yeah, it's just the way he's put together. You can really see what he's doing there. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's, it's, it's advantageous. Yeah, it's yeah. advantageous. That stance and that setup is advantageous. Yep. So we got our knees out. We got our shins against the bar. Not pushing the bar. They're just right. touching. They so that's kissed, three steps. Kiss the bar. That's right. Just barely touch the bar. Head the bar. And without dropping now, without dropping your hips. This is the hardest step. So if you're this in the gym the with me and I'm teaching you the deadlift, at this point, I walk up and I shove my index finger into your hip joint and I say, without dropping your hips, we want we want them to pull their chest up really hard and get all the muscles in their back short. So yep. that their back is tight and flat. Yep. We want the spine in extension. And people really struggle with that. It's the hardest thing to teach in coaching. It's the hardest thing to teach in coaching in person. And it's really hard online. Yeah. Um, there are lots of things. It's hard on a podcast, too. It's hard on a <laughs> podcast, right? So I use almost the same terminology you do. I say squeeze the chest up rather than pull the chest up. And I'll often like pat them on the back. Which you can't you know, do online, but firmly. in person you can, right? So so they can feel the muscles that I, that I need them to yep. contract. I want to wrinkle the shirt. I want to see those wrinkles. So the shirt is taut on the back, and when you squeeze your chest up, the shirt will wrinkle on your back, right? It will, it will make this kind of concave. Concave? Yep. Concave. And so, or, you know, butthole to the wall. Mm -hmm. nipples to the wall in front of you. So butthole to the wall, point your butthole mm -hmm. at the wall behind you, point your nipples at the wall in front of you, and that'll get it. And you have to do all those things without dropping your butt, right? right. Everybody wants to drop your butt. So again, for those of you guys watching video, if this is your back, this is your head, it's very easy to squeeze your back up in extension if you drop your butt. Yeah, almost everybody, when they're standing up straight, their spine's in extension. That's right. They bend over and then they lose extension. The problem is if you drop your butt, your knees went forward. And if your knees went forward, your shins were already touching the bar. So if you drop your butt, your knees go forward, your shins go forward, the bar goes forward, the bar's not over the middle of the foot anymore. So instead, we have to hold our butt in place. We have to hold our hips in place and then squeeze our back chest up as hard as we can and get our back as tight as we can. And essentially, we're going to use a term, we're going to lock our back in extension. Yeah, you have to. So once you get your chest up, get that back nice and flat, you hold it like that the entire time. That's right. I tell people 95% of your mental and physical energy will be in holding, holding the back and extension. Agreed. Almost everybody, everybody I've ever seen can leg press more than they can deadlift sure. because the back extension is the weakest link sure. in the deadlift. That's yep. the piece that fails. I agree. They can push more than they can pick up. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, for example, if a guy could put his back against the wall and put a 900 pound sled in front of him, he can probably push it with his feet, but he sure. couldn't pick it up. His Correct. back would round. Yep. 95% of your mental and physical energy will be in holding that extension. As a secondary or afterthought, you push the floor away with your feet for step five and drag the bar up your shins. Yep. So step five is to drag the bar up with your shins. And um, I want most of my people to think about a deadlift as being a push with my feet rather than a pull with my hands. Now, yep. we talked about cues. There are times when they do it wrong. And so we'll, we will flip it, flip it around. But for the most part, if you get tight, if step one, I take my stance one inch from the bar. Step two. I bend over and I grab the bar and my mm -hmm. back's going to be rounded at that point. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with having, nothing wrong with having a rounded back. Don't roll the bar. Don't take a step. Step three, shins forward till they touch the bar and knees out into the arm. Step four, squeeze the chest up. There's lots of little cues you can think about there, but squeeze the chest up without dropping your hips. And step five, I'm going to drag the bar up my legs, but I'm going to do that by thinking about leg pressing the earth away from my body. Right. And so what I'm going to do when I squeeze my chest up, I'm going to also pull the slack out of the bar. The first thing I'll hear is I'll hear the little 
kink, a ting mm-hmm. of the bar hitting the inside of the sleeve, right where the bushing is, right, right or where the bearings are. So the part of the bar you grab is just a piece of bar stock. It's been all straightened out and knurled and nice. And then that goes inside the collar, right? Because the collar, we have to put a collar on the bar so that the plates will spin, so that it won't twist out of your hand. So there's a little slack. It has to be, right? The, the hole the bar goes in and the collar has to be bigger than the bar. It won't go in there. So there's a little slack there. And the cheaper the bar is, the more the slack there is. Sure. So you pick it up and you can go f- click and you can feel that. And you hear it click. And then you pick it up a, a little more, click. And now the collar moves up and touches the underside of the inside diameter of yeah. the hole in the plate. That's right. And then there's five plates on there and you go click, click, click. And you can yep. feel all five of them. Go click, yep. click, 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 click. And then you push. Yeah, and if you if you really are in tune with this, which beginners won't be at all, but as you get stronger and stronger, I can feel the inside plate come off the ground, yeah, and the outside plate still be on the ground. And so at that point, the bar has all of the flexes come out of the bar, right? The inside plates are off the ground. I've got as much tightness as I can possibly get. There's no potential for energy loss at all for an energy leak, and then I just push real hard through the floor with my feet. So, and that initiates, and I want the knee extension, the knees going from bent to straight to initiate the movement of the bar. Again, right. what a lot of people do, <clears throat> because their hamstrings aren't strong enough to hold their hip in place, is their knee will extend first, but the bar doesn't move. That's right. If your knee extends first, well, think about it. it tur- if your knee extends first, it turns into a stiff leg deadlift. To a straight leg deadlift. If a straight leg deadlift, my legs are straighter. My back is more horizontal than it should be. My shoulders lurched forward, Mm -hmm. right? And everything is in a worse position. Now, here's the deal. It's actually easier, in my opinion, to get the bar off of the ground in a straight leg deadlift than it is in a correct deadlift. No, wait a minute. I know, I know. Well, I, I have a theory as to why. Why do you think it is? Well, the, the, the extensors of the hip are going to be stronger than the quads. And the hips are going to be higher. All right. Right, so their position so if you're like, vertically if you're, compared to horizontally goes up, and so they're in a little stronger position that again that where that fulcrum height is. So it's like it's turning you into a longer leg lifter. Well, longer leg lifter can deadlift more, except so the bar goes off the ground two inches, and now what do you do? Well, now it's just hanging out in in space. And yeah, you're it's going to swing out away from your legs. It's probably not going to stay on your shins, and so now you're in trouble. So if you do this right, it should look like you get as tight as you can against the bar. And you leg press the earth away, and it looks like you're squeezing the bar off the floor. Mm -hmm. If we jerk the bar off the floor, we don't want to jerk the bar off the floor. We squeeze off the floor. And then the second I feel the plates come off the ground, I'm going to go as fast as I can. Now, at 400 pounds for me, that's pretty fast. But at 650, it's all going to be slow. But Mm -hmm. I'm still going as fast as I can go. You bet. Yeah, so if you jerk the bar off the floor well, on a limited attempt or even a close to limited attempt, you pull your chest up, you get your back nice and flat, you get your back tight, 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 tight. And if you press the bar off the floor and you squeeze it off and you can feel that slack come out and you feel those plates come off, you can hold your back in isometric contraction and keep your chest up. Correct. But if you get a run at it, drop your hips and then uh, jerk it off the floor, it'll pull your back out of extension right. and now you're rounded and then you can't lock it out. You can That's get right. it over your knee. And then you just can't get your shoulders back. Correct. And you may be able to stand there all day. That's right. But you'll never get your shoulder behind the bar. Yeah. If you're somebody who <clears throat> struggles to lock out your deadlift at the top of a deadlift. Chances are. Rack pulls are not going to fix the thing. Chances are your back, your lumbar, your low back is not in good heart extension. Now, your thoracic back, your upper back, that's one of those things we've talked about these kind of changes to competitive lifts that some really good competitive lifters will actually allow their upper hmm. back some flexion because it cuts down on the range of motion. Aforementioned Constantine yeah, Constantinov. Constant, yeah, Constantine is the best that's ever done that. And um, and that's okay to do for a competitive lifter, but I want my lifters who I'm trying to get generally strong to understand and learn how to control this isometric contraction extension of not just the lumbar spine, hmm. but of the thoracic of, of the thoracic spine. And so uh, we hold our back as flat as we can and we pull it. And we don't let the back be an energy leak at all. Yeah, and we push with our feet cause we don't pull. You know, when people pull the bar, they tend to round over. Sure. It tends to make them round over, but not more often than that though, if they can keep their back in extension, it causes them to rock back, causes them to get their shoulder back. And then the bar comes off their shins. Yep. It's crazy. 
that when the bar, when you rock back, the sh- bar comes off your shins. Sure. You wouldn't think it would, but it does. Yep. Um, ball, the shoulder joint is not very robust. It's a really crappy cage. Like sure. The head of the humerus goes in a little a th- cage that has three points on it pretty yep. much. And it's, uh, I've never, I've never had a skeleton to play with. It wasn't all wired together, but I bet if it wasn't wired together, the arm would just fall out of that cage. Like it's not a tight fit. It's just a, it's a loose cage. Sure. So we can have this range of motion. So all the tendons and ligaments and muscles and stuff hold it up there. So when you deadlift and you push away from the floor, that bar is actually, it's not hanging from that joint. We think that it's hanging from your lat insertion on the in sure. your armpit. Yep. And the lat's pulling back at that humerus at very nearly a 90 degree angle to the humerus. And so that's why if you watch people, you know, in for years, I remember reading, um, you know, West Side and the, that group of guys, and they would visualize getting the shoulders, be- your shoulders behind the bar before you pulled. Gosh, I just don't see how that would possibly even work as a well, cue. But you know what I think they did? I think I think it was because I saw a lot of people with their shoulders lurch forward. Just like we talked about, if your if your mm. if your knees extend and your hips pop up and your shoulders lurch forward, and you turn into slightly deadlift and you're in trouble, right? That's right. And so they um, and so I think that's what they were visualizing, but it's mm. just wrong, right? It's just right. wrong. With every single heavy deadlift ever, go you can pick any good. I mean, really, no limit max attempt yeah. deadlift from the side. Every single deadlift on YouTube. The guy, the weight will not come off the ground. It will not break off the ground until the hips are high and the shoulders are forward of the bar. Now, right. can the hips go too high and the shoulders go too forward? Yes, yeah, of course so. they can, right? There is too far. But if you think that you can't, you know, you're not, you're supposed to lift with your legs, not with your back. You're supposed to sit your butt down. You're wrong. That's not right. We okay. don't lift with our legs, not with our back. We lift with our back. High hips, bar over the middle of our foot, because physics says so, because phys- the physics you can't get around. And so if I'm going to go pick up a lawnmower and put it in the back of my car, I'm going to get as close to that lawnmower as I can. I'm going to straddle that lawnmower. Straddle it. I'm going to keep my hips high. I'm going to bend over, grab that lawnmower right in the middle of the lawnmower, and my hands are going to be right over the middle of my foot. And I'm going to pick up that lawnmower with nearly straight legs and pick it up and put it in the back of my car. But if I squat way down, if I squat down to pick up the lawnmower, The lawnmower is now six inches in front of my body. And that's an enormous amount. That's a moment force multiplier. I have a tons more moment to overcome in order to put the the lawnmower in the back of my car, the back of my truck. And so we lift with our back, not with our legs. I hope you're enjoying this episode in the technique series of the Barbell Logic podcast. You know, at Barbell Logic, we believe that barbell-based strength training is literally for everyone, and that the only thing holding most people back from all the incredible benefits that come from it is good technique and consistency, and we can help with that too. And whether you're just getting started or you've been lifting for a while, it's difficult to know if you're performing the lifts correctly or if there's anything you can do to make your lifting better. We have tons of free resources online, from basic how-to videos that'll get you lifting safely and efficiently right away, the podcasts, articles, and videos that will help you troubleshoot common errors. All you have to do is visit barbelllogic.com slash technique to see our best technique-focused content in one place. And while you're at it, you can sign up for a consultation with a Barbell Logic coach. This is a free form check and a chance to ask an expert all your training-related questions. There's no reason you should be struggling to get started or to make progress. Check out barbelllogic.com slash technique for more information and sign up for the Barbell Logic experience. Again, it's 100% free. There's nothing better for your training than knowing you're lifting safely, training efficiently, and on the right track. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, so if you go look at the Ed Cohn, it's a sumo attempt, right? No, it's not an attempt. No, no, it's a, no, 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 it's not. It's not. It's conventional. Yeah, so, oh, so, that's right. So, and it's got so, the gold right. plates. You'll see it. So I believe it was... Mm. I think it was, I think it's 901. I think it's his 901 yeah. deadlift on, on YouTube. So Ed Cohn, he starts, uh, who's the greatest of all time powerlifter, and the guy used to sumo deadlift, and he switched in his later career. He had some sort of hamstring injury or something or hip, and he ended up switching to conventional deadlifts and conventional deadlift. If you watch this video, I believe it's Ed Cohn 901, right? Mm-hmm. It's at the USPF Nationals, I think. Anyway, he sits way down deep. I mean, he gets all the way down in basically what looks like a parallel squat. He's got short femurs, not very long, and so his shins are actually aren't that far forward. He doesn't really push the bar forward the, of the midfoot. The, the 901 is a, 901 is is a sumo. Is, right? It is a sumo. Oh, it is? Well, yeah. that's, not the, the, that's not the lift that we're talking about, though. Well, so. no, it's not. Let's see here. 
And so he sits way down. You really can watch any Ed Cone conventional deadlift. He sits way down. His back gets very vertical. And it looks like he's, and he starts to pull that bar and all the slack comes out of the bar and his hip pops up and his hip pops up and his hip pops up and his shoulders go forward and his back gets more horizontal. And when his back gets exactly where it needs to be so that it is in an optimal position to pull the weight off the ground, the weight comes off the ground. And hey, here's the deal. At 900 pounds, it's not coming off the ground in any other way. Now, can Ed Cohn do a 405 deadlift if the guy can deadlift 900 pounds? Can he do 405 deadlift with the bar out in front of his feet, just the mm, middle sure. of his foot a little bit, and his hips down low? Of course he can't. So he practiced that way, and he practiced that way, and he practiced that way. And if you asked him, he said, Ed, how did you deadlift? He would say, well, I just squatted down and, and grabbed the bar and dropped my butt, and I squatted the weight up. Wrong. He didn't. His butt pops up. His back gets horizontal. His shoulders move forward, and he gets in the exact same position that everybody else on earth gets when the weight comes off the ground. So just watch it. Watch when the weight actually comes off the ground. Did you find the video? It's, it's a 887. 887. What's the title of the video? Uh, Ed Cohn, 887 Deadlift. Okay. That's yeah. Easy, that's easy enough. I mean, and, and it doesn't even have to be a guy like Ed Cohn. Anybody who's actually pulling a max attempt, that's truly a max attempt. The bar has to be over the middle of the foot. By the way, this is the one where we don't have to think very much about bar path. Yep. A squat, you kind of have to think about bar path. There's so much that can go wrong. But a true max effort deadlift will move in a vertical straight line over the middle of your foot. Or it's not going to break off the ground. Yeah, it's self-regulating. People worry about getting hurt. If it's too heavy, it's not going to come up. That's it's right. fine. And it's you just put it down. It's easy to get started with it. I'm not going to say it's easy to perfect, but it's easy to get started with it. You know, I think you can, most people leave their first session with a better deadlift than they do a squat, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and the weight goes up, 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 you know, so the deadlift gets ahead of the squat for the novice pretty darn early. Yeah, pretty quick. And the longer <clears> legged you are, longer, longer limbed you are, it will probably stay above the squat yeah. for a long time. Now, Tim Roberts yesterday squatted 651 and yeah. smoked it, right? Had 25 or 30 pounds left. That, that guy's going to be 700 pound squatter soon. And mm -hmm. he deadlifted what? Just like right around six. 616. Yeah, yeah. So he like actually squats more, but he's a great big guy. He weighs over 300 pounds. He's not, he's not fat. He's just a big old. Just he's, he's, giant he's man. you know what? He's shaped. He reminded me of Joseph Pena when he walked in. Mm -hmm. So I'm mean, totally different guys. And he's, I don't know, how, how old is Tim? 34. Yeah, so he's way older than, than Joseph is. But but they're just built the same way. They're just thick and you know, giant hips, big butt, a lot of anterior pelvic tilt in their butt. You just walk in and go, yeah. like, man, if God was creating a squatter, like that's he was like, yep, make those guys. The reason we conventional deadlift is because conventional makes our back strong, which, by the way, is an important point here. The deadlift takes a lot of a lot of crap about the fact that, well, you know, it's it's got you could potentially hurt your back. Well, sure, you could right. potentially hurt your back. Certainly, if you do it wrong, just like if you squat wrong, and you hurt your knees. But for the most part, if you do it right and if you do it close to right and even if you do it kind of wrong, even if you do it kind of wrong, the worst thing you're going to do is is tweak something. And you're going to get back spasms for a week and they're going to go away and yeah. you get back under the bar. Think about all the people in the world who are like, I have a herniated disc in my back. Right. Everybody's right. like, I've got a herniated disc. And you go, oh, did you do that deadlifting? Like, oh, no, I did it because I dropped my keys on the floor. Right. No, I did it picking my kid up off the floor. Well, they bend over in the back, put they put their back in flexion, it rounds, and they twist, and they put it up, you know, right. something up on a counter or something. So, um, you know, or they just sleep on it wrong or something weird happens. And so it's, it's rare from the deadlift. And so for me, if I can teach our clients and myself and my family and the people that I love to deadlift correctly and get their back strong, a strong back is a less vulnerable back to injury, not a more vulnerable back to injury. And so right. deadlift is really strong. Hey, one thing we didn't mention is a lockout. The deadlift is locked out. We, we, kind of, we walked you through the fifth step is to drag the bar up your legs, right? Well, how far do you drag the bar up your legs? Well, you drag the bar up your legs with totally straight elbows mm -hmm. until your hips are in full extension and your knees are in full extension, right? Your and your chest is up. Right. And so we don't shrug. We don't do anything with our shoulders. Our shoulders never lift up. It's too we, heavy anyway. Uh, correct. We never bend our elbows. So elbows are straight. Shoulders hang. And we basically, one of the cues I'll use for the chest, well, there's two cues. The clean cue is, the clean one, is I picture like a meat hook under mm, my breastbone right. and it lifts my breastbone up and I just get like a proud chest. I saw some people yeah. squeeze their butt cheeks together and yeah. stand, it stand up proud. And that yeah. normally will get it. By the way. The squeezing the butt cheeks together is a cue. It's not a thing we do to activate the glutes. That's right. We don't activate glutes on a on a on a deadlift. If, if you, you stood up with it, your glutes got activated. Right. right? 
If you can walk normally, you can activate your right. Brain. So if you're if you're if you have a real problem like you you've got nerve damage, you got spina bifida, then it's possible that your your glutes aren't working correctly. So the glutes make the hips extend. That's what the glutes do. Right. Right. Your big giant gluteus maximus, the one that your grandma spanked, that's going to work, and you don't have to activate that. But it is a pretty good cue to kind of crack the walnut or squeeze your butt cheeks together. Hmm. So you've got to stand up tall. Hold it. And by the way, I like a deadlift. I think a deadlift should be held for a second or two at the top. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, if you're in training, hold that thing as long as you can. I mean, well, especially stay. for the last, the last round, yeah. you're going to set a five. Just hold it for five or six seconds. And stand there for an eight count. I mean, who cares? You'll right? know if you really locked it out because right before you lock it out, like everything's hard, everything's hard, and you're grinding, you're grinding, you're grinding. And the bar is just over the middle of your foot, but you're not really in balance yet because you're yeah. pulling not just up, but you're kind of pulling back to try to get in balance and get everything locked in compression. And there's no more moment. Right. right. So a split second before you lock your deadlift out, your segments are in, in moment. There's a little bit of moment on the shin. There's a little bit of moment on the femur, on the thigh. And there's a little bit of moment on the back. And the second all those come into in the line and they come into compression. Once I lock out a deadlift, the heaviest deadlifts I've ever locked out, you know, 725 deadlifts and even heavier in strongman when we had partial deadlifts. Once it locks out, I can stand there all day. You might even be able to talk. You can talk, right? Yeah. Like if you remember Eddie Hall's, have you watched Eddie Hall's yeah. world, his first world record deadlift where he deadlifted whatever he did, 1,050 or something. That's the outdoor so, one. Yeah, outdoor. And the yeah. female r- reporter comes running up to him. He holds the bar <laughs> and does an interview. Savagery. And answers like three questions and then puts the bar down. This is like the heaviest deadlift ever pulled, right, right. at the time. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're one of those people at the top of your deadlift, your face is still squirming and squeezing, and you're like, ah, then it's probably not actually locked out. Right. Get it locked out, hold it, enjoy it, and then Safer. put it down. And by the way, we put it down. Mm. We should talk about putting it down. You bet. We put it down so at the top of a deadlift, our hips and knees are both an extension. The thing we break at to put it down is the hips, not the knees. Keep the knees locked. Yeah, squeeze those knees. Push your rump straight, straight back. back. Slide the bar down your legs. You're essentially doing a really fast beginning of an RDL. Hmm. Okay. You RDL it, the bar slides down your thighs, and as soon as the bar passes your knees, a little then you can bend your knees, right? But you don't bend your knees until it passes the knees. And then, by the way, the speed on the way down on a deadlift is very fast. Right. It's not... It ain't a controlled drop, but it's one step from a controlled drop. We keep yeah, it, and we never drop it, by the way. Don't drop, drop it. it. Don't drop it. Right? You hear me, Nick Hammer? Don't you di- don't you drop your PR deadlifts. Right. Nick Hammer dropped a PR deadlift a couple weeks ago. Did he lose his grip? No, we just dropped it because he was just, you know, being a cro- – he wants to be a crossfair. Oh, I see. He's a 240-pound no. power that deadlifts 700 pounds. <laughs> no, so he's, unlock the hips. So, unlock the hips. Tight knee. Rump back, slide the bar down your legs. When it gets past your knee, do a little squat and sit it down. That's right. And, and it should all be it, real fast. And it'll put it right back in the original right over the middle of your position. Foot. And if, as long as you kept your back in extension, you can do another rep immediately. That's exactly right. And so let's mention that, by the way. We work reps on deadlift almost always, right? So it's pretty mm-hmm. rare that we're doing a max effort deadlift. So if we do a set of five, lots of people can walk through this five-step process. Stand up with a bar. Put it down, and they almost always put it down in front of the middle of their foot. By the way, as much as I try, I often put it down in front of the middle of my foot, right? So this is not like it's really, really common. So you put the bar down. Now the bar is like an inch in front of the middle of your foot. Now let's go back to the five steps, okay? Step one was your stance. Well, I'm already in my stance. Step two is my grip. Well, I already have a grip on the bar, right? right? By the way, a deadlift starts from a dead stop every single rep. We don't ever touch and go a deadlift, we right? We don't dribble it. We don't dribble it, right? We set it down, we breathe out, we breathe in, we squeeze our chest up, and we pull as long as the bar is over the middle of my foot. Right. If I put the bar down in front of the middle of my foot, what's the very first thing I have to do? Got to roll it back. I got to roll it back to the middle of my foot. So what I do, and you want to break, I want a pause. Mm-hmm. Between all five steps. Yeah, you need to pause long enough to run your quick mental checklist. Is That's it the exactly right, right spot? My knee's out, my back flat. Okay, push. That's exactly right. So step one, I walk up, take my stance, make sure I'm one inch from the bar, toes are pointed out, 15, 20 degrees. We didn't mention that, but it's the same thing as, as squats. Basically, it's about the same angle. And stop. Bend over, grab the bar, don't roll the bar, stop. Shins forward to the bar, knees out, Stop. Squeeze the chest up, squeeze the chest up, squeeze the chest up, 
set my back as hard an extension. It feels like my face is going to pop off. There's yep. so much pressure. This is not a comfortable position to be if in. If it's comfortable, it's in wrong. Step four, if it's comfortable, it's wrong. If it's comfortable, you drop your hips. If it's right, we're good. Stop. Drag the bar up the legs and do that by leg pressing the earth yep. away. Stand up to the top. Lock it out. Stop. Break at the hips. Slide the bar down. Break at the knees. Put it on the ground. Now, bars in front of the middle of my foot a little bit. Roll it back Go to the middle of my this. foot. Stop. Squeeze the chest up and go. By the way, when you talk about breathing too, so when does the breathing occur? Between what steps? We breathe on the whole. Yeah, so we breathe between step three and step four primarily. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to breathe between. So I'm going to set my shins forward till my shins touch the bar and knees out. And then I'm going to take a breath. And then I'm going to squeeze my chest up, which is why it makes me all like lightheaded and my face gets yep. purple. And then I pull, right? If I try to breathe <clears throat> after I've squeezed my chest up, my lungs have been compressed a little bit and I can't get as much air in. Right. So I want to get as much air in as I can. So I get all the inner abdominal pressure and then I squeeze my chest up, stop, and then pull. Yep. And it works really well. And we don't dribble this bar. Ever. One, because we want it to be a deadlift. It has to be pulled from a dead stop. You know, we almost all train on some sort of a rubber surface, you know, and there's a little bounce there and that helps yep. it off the floor. We don't want the help. Nope. We don't know how strong we are if we, uh, if we dribbled it. Yep. But, more importantly, I think, is when that bar bounces, it tends to let you pull the back out of extension. Yep. It makes you, you know, every time they bounce it, they get a little rounder, a little rounder, a little rounder. By yep. the fifth rep, they're just, they're just hunched over like a dog, man. Yep. I love people who have really <clears throat> dedicated themselves to being a form technician on deadlift. They're the funnest to watch because the funnest, mm -hmm. the funnest to work. The most funnest. <laughs> because you can watch them hit all five of those positions. Yep. Every single rep, even if they put it down, something goes a little bit wrong. And most of those guys who are, and females who are form technician, put it down right in the middle of their foot. But if, but they'll check it, they put it down, oop, maybe it's a quarter inch right. forward, roll it back. So the problem is if you put it down slightly in front of the middle of your foot and you think, okay, step three, shins forward. Now my shins are too far forward because right. the bar's not in the right spot. And then you put it down a little more forward on rep number three. And then you put it down a little more yeah. forward on rep number four. And the next thing you know... The bar's over your toes. You're squatting way down because you've got to squat all the way down and get your shins to touch, touch the, the barbell. So you've got to make sure that the barbell on subsequent reps gets Wait rolled back over to the middle of your foot. What Subsequent? Subsequent. Is this like hypertrophy and hypertrophy? Subsequent. Oh, I call it subsequent. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Are you psychoanalyzing? I don't know. It says a lot about a man. <laughs> it says the guy it says hyper hypertrophy. That's right. So one it, of these days I'm gonna go to BJ's trophy shop in Springfield, Missouri, and I'm gonna get me a hypertrophy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have them build you a hypertrophy. Well, listen, things can have a hypertrophic effect. Mm -hmm. Do they have hypertrophic effects? <laughs> I don't know. We, we Sub, subsequential. Subsequential. <laughs> I don't know either. So do you want to talk programming real quick? And yes. Wrap this up? Yeah. So uh, all the lifts, all the main lifts in linear progression, we do for three sets of five. Mm -hmm. For the power clean, we do for five sets of three. This one is different. It's so awful, or it's <laughs> awfully good, so we only do five of them. We do one, one set, set of, of five. five. Correct. Uh, it's just so darn stressful. And it's the end of the session. You're petered out. You yep. know. Uh, so we do one set of five. I heard that about you. You get petered out a I lot. I do. I do. Yeah. Right, right now. <laughs> and we often take much, much larger jumps in weight in the beginning of mm -hmm. LLP on the on the deadlift. Sure. So a young man, the prototypical, you know, novice, he's probably gonna take some ten pound jumps on his squat. He might take some twenty pound jumps for a short time sure. on the on the deadlift. It's yeah, not for uncommon. A week to five five workouts, maybe yep. somewhere in there. Yep. And we deadlift in the beginning every single session. Yep. It, also three times a week, one set of five jumping some weight every single time. And then within a, a couple weeks, you're jumping five pounds at a time. But, you know, yep. so if somebody starts at 135, you, you might go 135, 155, 175. And then the next week, you might go 185, 195, 205. Well, in two weeks, yep. I've gone from 135 to 205, right? And then I might, and then I might Gosh. go 210, 215, 225 or whatever. You know, you've, you've probably had them. You've probably had the under 25, underweight male that's drinking the milk and eating the calories go up 120 pounds in six weeks. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm sorry, two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. Uh, 20, yeah, 20, 20, do it six times in a row. Yeah, six times in a row. It's yeah. probably, that's, that's happened for sure. Now, a lot of that's because, that, you know, obviously, that a 135 for a set of five wasn't a limit lift on day one. No, I've had them 
right. But their form was jacked up enough that we had to make sure they could actually, you know, y- younger, actually younger guys tend to have a, in my experience, younger males have the hardest time setting their back in extension. And so, um, you know, middle-aged guys actually tend to do a little better than younger guys, and women have no problem setting no their back in extension. And so, yeah, we might be able to jump a little faster than, than normal with those guys. And then what do we do mm. after it stops working? And so the deadlift is just a very stressful lift. Yep. Um, we've heard this for years, by the way, and I don't know if we can dictate exactly why that is. I remember why it's so stressful. I, yeah. Well, I remember like well, the absolute weight's going to be higher than anything it is, else. It's a little, but I mean, is it? But the problem is. So think about this. So again, if you talk about tonnage, it, your tonnage of one set of five is far less than your tonnage on three sets of five on squats. Even if the squats well, is fifteen percent less, you've weight. already squatted. Right. You already squatted. That's true. You're tired. And, you know, the squat's on your back. You're not having to hold it in your darn hands. You, you know, your biceps aren't, you know, trying to tear off the bone. You yeah. know, I mean, it, it's the, the the systemic stress in the deadlift, I think, is higher. Yeah, I actually think you can find some studies on PubMed. I did this, you know, I mean, recently, like in 1998 or 1999. <laughs> <laughs> no, somewhere in there in the early 2000s or somewhere, we did some studies. And there was there was some published reports, which, again, take that all with a grain of salt. God knows they're probably terrible. Um but that heavy weight in your hand uh, was harder to recover from than really anything else. So super, super, super heavy weight. So you think about, yeah, I don't doubt that. You think about strong men doing like farmer's walks with 400 pounds per hand yeah. running down the street. Like, I don't know if you can do anything that's really harder on your body than that. And so um, we do one set of five, three days a week. If you're young. Now we're getting ahead. So we did 20 pound jumps for a while. Okay. Maybe we only do them for one session or two. Sure. Maybe maybe we do them for longer. If you get a hoss in front of you, some talented person, then we'll go very quickly to a 10-pound jump, and then we'll go very quickly maybe to a five-pound jump. So nothing can sustain those longer jumps, sorry, those larger jumps as long as the deadlift. That's correct. And then unless there's a very elderly person, I don't, I have, I don't think I've ever taken anybody under 60 to two-and-a-half-pound jumps on a deadlift. Yeah, it's pretty rare. Uh, that's pretty rare. I mean, they would have to have. I mean, it, it, they'd have to have some 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 problems. Yeah, if they're, if they're they'd be compromised. Yeah, older in some female, way. Or just like you said, over sixty. You're seventy years old, and so, I mean, certainly I do it with civil, um, but with most people, I don't. Yeah, so they, we're going to take those jumps. Be pretty aggressive with the jumps when we can, as long as they can keep the back of the extension. We're going to keep piling the weight on, and then we're going to get down to the five pound jumps, and maybe six, eight weeks, maybe a little more into it. Three times a week is going to be too darn much. For a couple of reasons, their squat got real heavy, sure, and then the deadlift got real heavy too. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a just a lot of volume, day. sure. And we, you know, we have an A and a B workout. They have you drop it on one of those workouts. Our demographic continues to skew a little older, and so uh, most of our people don't power clean, and so we need a replacement for the deadlift. It's not a power clean, and so I tend to drop the Wednesday deadlift out and replace it with a barbell row. Yeah, those tend to work pretty well. And, you know, of course, we'll chin. We love to chin. And I think chins the, chin, the chins probably contribute some. Yeah. And I put chin days depending on how young they are and their ability to chin. Sometimes I have them chin on all three days. And sometimes I have them chin on the barbell row day. Yep. Um, that's what it I just, have. yeah. So they end up barbell rowing and chinning on Wednesday. And then I keep their deadlifts at two times a week. And then when that stops working, then usually what I'll do is I actually increase their volume a little bit on their deadlift yep. on Monday and decrease their volume on Friday. So I might drop them to a top set of three on okay. Friday and maybe two sets of five on Monday. Two fives. Yeah. And, and I reduce the weight, you know, 10% or 12% to start yep. to give them a little bit of a deload there, then let them start working back up. And then we do that till it doesn't work. And then I might actually go to a third set of five. So, well, a couple of things about chins. We'll go back to chins here and then we'll talk about this. Monday, Friday programming from the deadlift, the chins, I find that, man, these older ladies, Charity and I have found that they benefit from the supinated lat pull down or assisted deadlifts so much because they have a really hard time keeping the bar on their shins. Mm -hmm. So they can keep their shin angle correct, keep their hip in the right spot, and the bar still will come off their shins. Their lats just aren't strong enough. Yep. So we find that those older ladies in particular need to start doing lat pull downs pretty early i do it every session with them yeah, some every t- session i do it yeah. it's like sybil every session that's as like, hard as, as they can go that's right she does her squats <clears throat> she does her presses she does her deadlifts and then as soon as she's done with deadlifts she's going to do a supinated lat pull down every single workout three workouts a, a week mm-hmm. yep every single time yeah they before the volume before the uh, frequency gets them 
the bar will swing out and yep. they've got to start doing those lap pull yep. downs. So we, I love that for those older folks and, and, uh, yeah, me too. and Charity loves that. And then you say that you'll increase some volume on Monday and then decrease it on Friday, mm-hmm. you know? And so as part of that minimum effective dose idea, I've actually been introduced a heavy then back offs first. Mm-hmm. So what I've been doing is both days, Monday on both days. Okay. Yeah. So maybe a guy peters out at three fifteen for set of five, or maybe he, maybe only triples it, you know, mm-hmm. and then we're like, mm, that's over. Uh, then let's say he does it on Friday. So Monday I'll have him pull a single at 320 and then I'll have it back off like maybe 5%. doesn't take much sure. and then he can get it. He can sure. get, he can make it through his work and then do the same on Friday. So now he's going to do 325 in a back offset. Then that doesn't work. And then I'll have the heavy in a back offset on Monday and then only what would be the back offset on Friday. Right. And then I'll take a then I'll take a, a rep off of that, and so you know we just continue to massage that. Yeah. But as long as one I one step at a time. Yep, I just want to keep that weight piling on the bar. The squat teaches us a lot about ourselves, but so does the deadlift. Sure, you know the deadlift is was the first one I blacked out on. Yep. <laughs> a lot of people pass out with the press, but yep. uh, I, I black out on the deadlift the first time. By the way, the you know we've. We talk a lot about the grinding, the the five seconds of grind that applies more on a deadlift than anything else. Yeah, and listen, it's not about a grind. No. It's not about we want people, our, our trainees to do, you know, max effort on every session. No, of it's that not. it takes, it, it takes a while for the, the trainee to learn how long it takes to deadlift. Sure. You know, if it weighs double body weight, it takes a little time to come off the floor. You sure. got to be patient with yourself and patient with your body and patient with the whip and the bar and stay with it. So it comes off the ground, yep. but you can do a set and leave a couple in the tank and it's still slow. So we don't want them to grind themselves to powder. We want them to learn to stay with it, to be Correct. persistent and to be tough, Yeah, what you'll to be see anti-fragile. With, yeah, we've said this before. You'll see people pull <clears throat> for two seconds. The bar doesn't break off the ground. They just stop and give up. Well, look, you didn't pull long enough, right? And then had they right. pulled one more second, the bar would have broke off the ground and it would have gone up smooth. It wouldn't right. have even been a grind. And then we've seen people, as they get a little further, the next step is it comes off the ground. And then it, the place where a deadlift tends, if you, if you hold form really well, it's going to grind the most or slow down the most at about your tibial bump. So, you yep. know, three, four inches below your knee and, and you can't get to that point, let it slow way down and go up. I'm not going to get it and set it down. You've got it. But yep. what you'll notice is you, you'll grind through that little spot a little bit. And once it gets above your patella, whoop, it just slides back up really, yep. really quick. Now, again, if you're locking it out really slow, start venting yourself from the side, I bet your low back especially is actually not in hard extension. Yeah, so. I did rack pulls for you mm, yeah, a few days ago. I don't know, whatever it was, late yep. last week. How long did it take it to come off the pins? Probably four seconds before it actually. One, action. two, three, four. The whole time I'm purple. Yep. <laughs> and then it broke off the ground, and then we're fine. Yeah, right. And and so we want people to learn how to do that. It's not about max effort work every day and grinding yourself to power. It's about learning that. Yep. The deadlift is the first place where we can learn that. It takes a lot of experience to start learning to grind and push, 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 push persistently Listen. on the squat. You can learn it on the deadlift first. Sure. That's and then right. you can apply those lessons to the press, the bench press, and the squat. Yeah, although, although <clears throat> you get down there to the bottom of a squat, especially if, I mean, it's a little scarier to, not a little, it's a lot scarier to bell on a squat. Bell, so yeah. I'll, I'll tell you this for me as I, you know, as I come back from injury or business or whatever, just being a lazy turd and I start to, and I start to really lift again. When I get to a heavy squat in the bottom, man, I don't miss very many squats because it's scary to miss squats. Now I think yeah, you need fine. to know, I, I know you do. <laughs> so, you know, Listen, don't you need, bail. No, you don't, don't bail. bail. You, don't, you never bail, but think, take a knee. If but you've I also put think it down. most people, most people, like you can teach yourself to bail. But most people, you get down there under that heavy weight, most people end up grinding it back up. You know, they're like, ooh, I'm gonna, what, I don't want to put this down. It's, you know, it's on me. Right. And so they have a tendency, and it's more ingrained into their instincts to grind against the squat. Hmm. On a deadlift, it starts to grind, and you're just like, I just set it down, right? Now, see. I've noticed even for me, as I get my deadlift back up each time, and I get it up, say, just over 600 pounds. So, again, I'm a just just, a, just over 700-pound deadlifter of all time. 725, I get to about 600. It starts getting real heavy. I'll pull 635, 
and it'll start to grind and I'll put it down. Yeah. So I want to, I want to be clear that this is not something I just yell at people at this. Is something I've experienced it's many, hard. many times. I was, it was, you know, about six months ago when we were in Tulsa, <laughs> we were doing a, a thing with Brett McKay yeah. and I think I pulled 650 for 655 and I, and it was moving just fine and it, it got just below my knees and I thought I was going to miss it. And I set it back down and he said, what, what happened? Did you hurt yourself? Yeah, you I thought, thought I'd I, injured myself. Yeah, I thought you pulled a hamstring. I said, no, I missed it. And he said, dude, it's still going up. And I was yeah. like, dang it, show me the video. And then sure enough, it was, it just slowed down. And, and so you, you really have to teach yourself to learn how to get through those, those, those places where it's really, really hard. That's why it teaches us about herself. Yeah. I love the deadlift. Yeah. It's awesome. Good. What else do we have to say about that damn I'm thing? I'm out. It's been a long episode. It has been. So, thanks for listening to us talk about the deadlift ad nauseum. Go to iTunes, give us a five star review. Go to, uh, and go with subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Encourage your friends to do that. YouTube also. Yep. Subscribe. Follow Logic YouTube. Love subscribers. Yep, subscribe there. to our YouTube channel. And more and more there every day. But thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon.